today in our program from wherever you are. SIGA is an independent nonprofit research and public policy institution that's based in Istanbul, Turkey. It's affiliated with Istanbul Zaim University. Its mission is to conduct high quality research and analysis, educate the public and policymakers, train experts, and propose novel ideas and policy recommendations regarding global policies and relations impacting the Islamic world and the development and progress of Muslim societies. In the past five years, we've organized 10 international conferences and over 150 seminars, webinars, book discussions, workshops, and symposia. Today, we are pleased to announce the premiere of our new activity called Diwaniya, or Town Hall Meeting. <laughs> it gives me a, an immense and great pleasure to have with us today in our first Diwaniya the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, His Excellency, Mr. Imran Khan. He really needs no introduction. But the most striking thing about him is his ability to inspire millions of people, not only in his nation, but across the Muslim world and beyond. Perhaps no leader has been able to galvanize that many people in the streets across Pakistan since the founder of the state, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Today, we will ask the Prime Minister questions that will focus on international affairs, global politics, the Muslim world, and many other topics. But before we start our questions, I would like to thank our audience here who come from across the Muslim world, who would also participate in the questioning uh, of questioning the Prime Minister. But before we do that, I would like to introduce my colleague and co-moderator, Mr. Awais Khan, who is uh, 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 research fellow here at SIGA. He will explain the format of today's program and how it will be conducted. Always. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to everybody. Um, this is our inaugural Diwaniya event. Uh, it is a event inspired tradition, uh, Muslim tradition, in which public leaders uh, bring together scholars, public policy experts, and students and engage in an open, on-the-record dialogue about issues of mutual concern. So today, um, I'm honored and esteemed to have all of, all of these very bright minds and thought leaders from the Muslim world here gathered together with Mr. Imran Khan. Uh, the format of the session will be that we have collected a number of questions from online and from other platforms, and we have grouped these in um, 15 odd categories and each category uh, will ask a question um, it will take um, 60 seconds approximately on the questioner's behalf and then we will have a back and forth conversation with His Excellency uh, each question we hope to give uh, an average of 5 minutes in response so um, I welcome everybody and without further delay Let's jump right in. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us. We really are delighted here to have you with us. The first question and the first segment involves world and regional politics. And the first question is about Russia, the United States, and the war in Ukraine. Some international scholars believe that the West, particularly the United States, has goaded Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. They argue that ever since the fall and disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 and up until perhaps 2017 we had a unipolar world which the United States exploited in order to expand NATO turn as many countries in Europe to become Western liberal democracies under its tutelage and further weaken Russia. This aggressive US strategy they argue has provoked Russia and is considered the main reason of the for the war in Ukraine. On the other hand, the majority of Western leaders argue that the main reason for invading Russia is an aggressive Russian policy where Russian leader Vladimir Putin wants to restore Greater Russia and subject some of the former Soviet satellites to Russia's rule and dictates. You've been a keen observer of world politics and dealt directly with world leaders. Which argument do you believe, and how do you see the end of this brutal conflict? 
Thank you very much <clears throat> for inviting me to this, uh, your first, I believe, inaugural session uh, on question and answers. Uh, I want to thank Sika for honoring me uh, uh, today. And I hope I'll be able to answer all your questions. Now, this is uh, the, the, the whole Ukraine-Russian conflict. <clears throat> I happen to be uh, visiting Moscow uh, on the day when uh, uh, Russia decided to go into Ukraine. So, you know, I had a meeting that same day with President Putin. So I know the Russian point of view. And the Russian point of view is that we had repeatedly indicated to the Western countries that we would not allow NATO to come right onto our uh, doorsteps. And uh, their argument is that just like the United States would not want Russia to all their weaponry. So the, the, the conflict from the Russian point of view has been triggered out of fear that if NATO moves in to Ukraine, uh, which they felt should have been demilitarized or should have been neutral, uh, they felt that then the security of Russia was at stake. And the other thing was that President Putin kept saying that uh, in the past, Western leaders, American leaders, had all told him that, look, this will not happen. And they had given him assurances. Uh, and so unfortunately, he said that these assurances are broken and, uh, and hence the conflict. The Western point of view is very straightforward that this is a uh, Russian aggression. It's invasion. It's uh, coming into their, uh, they invaded a country and, and they're blaming uh, Russia for all the this destruction that is taking place due to war. So now my point of view, I basically feel that countries like Pakistan, we should not become partisan in this. You know, this we should not pass value judgments on this or moral judgments on this. The reason, uh, I don't feel that our countries should uh, get involved in conflicts that don't affect us. And I'm talking about developing world, countries like Pakistan, which have 100 million people vulnerable, almost 50 million people below the poverty line, 50 million people above the poverty line. And so when we make moral judgments in conflicts, uh, it, it comes at a cost for countries like us. So, for instance, we would wa have wanted cheap oil from Russia. We would have wanted uh, wheat from 2 million tons of wheat from Russia. Uh, a gas pipeline uh, was arranged uh, with, with a Russian company. So all that gets affected the moment you take sides. And, you know, our neighbor India, which is a, which is a part of the Quad, which is a strategic military, uh, uh, economic military alliance with the United States, India abstained in this because they too felt that they needed cheap oil from Russia. And what this conflict has done uh, post the COVID situation where already there was a commodity super cycle uh, and this conflict has raised energy prices to the level which is causing a lot of problems in Europe. We all know that in Europe they are suffering from gas shortages and energy prices spike. But in the developing world, it has caused a massive problems in our balance of payments because or it has just the oil prices going up there i know they're coming down now but that caused a enormous problem for countries like us so therefore my take on this there are two points of view we would like to abstain my country we would like to abstain in this uh, but i do feel that this uh, conflict has caused massive problems all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, the next question is about China and always will answer will ask that question. Uh, keeping with our theme about world and regional politics, um, we'd like to stick with uh, talking about the great powers. Uh, for, the, for the past three decades, uh, the power of China has been on a steady rise economically, military and technologically among other spheres. It, is, it has certainly become a world power. Pakistan has also been one of its major partners, not only economically, but also geopolitically. 
how will Pakistan maneuver between China and the United States, particularly in growing U.S. pressure on Pakistan to take sides? Um, how do you envision the role of China in a multipolar world and in competition with the U.S.? Well, OS, the problem is that, you know, when we are countries, again, I sort of following from your first question. When we are we countries, we developing countries that are, are pushed to take sides. And I feel that Pakistan should not take any sides. I'm talking about our country. Because, you know, why, why do we have to take sides? Pakistan should have good relationship with both China and with the United States. Uh, similarly, I feel with Russia and, and the United States. For instance, that's the policy of India. I must say that I've always admired the way India remained non-aligned during the Cold War. I thought it was a, a sensible thing to do. I mean, when you become part of a bloc, that means that the whole other bloc is excluded from you. And of course, you know, great powers do put a lot, enormous pressure on you to take sides. So let me first say that China-Pakistan relationship goes back a long time, 60 years. And China has been what we call always a friend in need. China has stood by Pakistan, you know, whether it is on international forums, on politics. For instance, Kashmir is an issue, a United Nations resolution on Kashmir stating that there should be there should have been a plebiscite in Kashmir for the people of Kashmir to decide whether they wanted to be with India or Pakistan. And that right was not given to them. But no other, hardly any other country stands with us. Uh, China has always stood with us. And I must say, Turkey has stood with us. But you know, other even Muslim countries, despite knowing the, the uh, injustice going on in Kashmir, just like in Palestine, they do not uh, stand with us, which is, by the way, one of the reasons I feel that when we are told to take sides in, in a conflict like Ukraine, why should we? When things that are important to us, uh, the Western countries don't take a stand or moral stand on it. And so I feel that, uh, so I think we should be non-aligned in this. We should be neutral. We should be friendly with both. But about China, I have seen the uh, development of China in the last 30 years. And I must say, what they have achieved uh, is there is no precedence in human history of what China has achieved. They have lifted 700 million people out of poverty in the last 35, 40 years. It's never been done in human history. And when you go to China, the rate of their development is phenomenal. And I just do not think that uh, Western countries will be able to compete with them because, you know, the electoral politics, it, uh, it has its limitations. I mean, the amount of maneuvering a democratic government, which, which, uh, which comes about through electoral politics, uh, it, you have a lot of limitations. In China, what is considered national interest, the people stand with the government. And what they managed to do, like, for instance, shifting populations, uh, I don't think that happened in Western countries. So I, I just don't think uh, that the other countries will be able to stop the growth of China. Uh, their, their system of meritocracy. Uh, I, I vis visited China and I saw the, the way they bring up all their talent. And then their single focus, long-term planning. Uh, I haven't seen such long-term planning uh, in most countries. Uh, certainly countries like us, which every five years are supposed to have elections. So very rarely governments plan beyond five years. But in China, they have just planned so far ahead. And then they single-handedly pursue their goals. And, and I feel that, you know, China is going to be the... Uh, I, I think it will leave everyone behind. Thank you very much. Uh uh, respected Chairman, uh, I cannot uh, leave the issue of China aside as a Muslim think tank and not raise the plight of the Uyghur Muslims. Um, a l on a lot of issues, Muslims around the world are concerned about the events that are happening in Xinjiang. Um, Pakistan has been a champion of Muslims all around the world. How do we 
hold both of this in tension? Well, let me say that, uh, you know, the Pakistan-China Pakistan relationship is such uh, that whatever the issues of uh, Uyghurs, uh, we have always, uh, the Chinese have always preferred to speak behind closed doors. They're very, uh, you know, their uh, system is such that they hate talking about sensitive issues like Uyghurs in public. So we have had discussions with them and they give us a different uh, side of their story. And all, there are always two sides of the story. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, the conversations I've had with the, the Chinese government on Uyghurs, we have always, uh, knowing the sensitivity they feel, we've kept that uh, behind closed doors. Thank you so much. Um, I want to I want to now uh, ask one of our members here to direct the next question. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Mubin Shah, who is the head of the Istanbul uh, Kashmir House. Excellency, this is Dr. Mubin Shah, Kashmiri in exile. As far as we can tell, in its hour of need, Pakistan has all but abandoned Kashmir in everything but territory. What is your and PTI solution for the people of Kashmir? When in power, how would you maneuver support for Kashmiri resistance movement, taking Ukraine as a model within Muslim world, with OIC as the biggest support factor to impose sanctions and back resistance of Kashmiris militarily? In these challenging times, what is Pakistan's solution to grave issues faced by Muslims in South Asia? particularly in India. Excellency, I thank you. Uh, well, Mubin, you know, when I was the Prime Minister, we took a very strong stand for Kashmir. And I think uh, you would have known that we have uh, on every, my government at least, on every international forum, we spoke about the people of Kashmir, especially after uh, 5th August 2019, when they took away the statehood of Kashmir, which was against all uh, international uh, uh, laws. It was against the United Nations Security Council resolution, which clearly stated that, uh, uh, you know, Kashmir would have a special status until they were given their right of self-determination. So without giving them the right of self-determination, they, um, they took away the statehood. So we, you know, we stood with the people of Kashmir and we broke all relationship with India. And that has remained up to this point. Uh, it's, it's the case now that we, ha we actually have broken relationship with India. And at every international forum, we have tried to put pressure on them. Now, apart from that, what else can we do? Give them moral support, support them everywhere. But when you say, uh, I don't know what you mean. I mean, do you think we should militarily uh, go into Kashmir, which is obviously clearly not an option? There are two nuclear armed countries. It's not a Ukraine type situation. Pakistan and India, the moment there is a, a conflict, I think there is always a danger that it will go out of hand. You know, in Ukraine, for instance, if Ukraine had nuclear weapons, firstly, this might not have happened, this conflict. But had it happened, they would, the whole world would have been petrified of, of, of a nuclear war. So therefore, with Pakistan and India, military solutions are not an option. Short of that, what else can we do? We'll raise it on every forum. And it has cost Pakistan quite a lot by breaking away uh, all diplomatic relationships with India since 5th August 2019. So what kind of words of hope can you give the people of Kashmir? Because this is a very big picture right now. It's, you know, circumstances always change. Uh, I am a firm believer that, um, you know, you, you just keep pressure. People of Kashmir have patience. They have given tremendous sacrifices. Almost, what, 100,000 Kashmiris ha uh, have been martyred in the last 30 years or 30, just about 40 or around about 40 years. Um, but, you know, they are resolute. They're not giving up. And this will, uh, sooner or later, the Indian government will have to restore their, their, uh, their rights. At the moment, the people of Kashmir are just deprived of all rights. And what the Indian government hopes to do is to uh, 
alter the balance, the demography of Kashmir by settling in non-Muslims into non-Kashmiris and Muslims into Kashmir. And what they hope is that eventually the balance will be changed. And when they have elections or plebiscite, there will be more non-Muslims who will then vote for India. So this is the game plan for India. But it's not working because uh, the people of Kashmir have not given up. And I think the settlers find it very difficult to move into Kashmir in a hostile environment. And I, I really believe, I am a firm believer that Kashmiris will get their independence, their Thank right you. of self-determination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question is about Pakistan's nuclear policy. And it would be asked by Dr. Nizar Krekish, who is the director of the Bayan Center for Studies from Libya. Dr. Thank Nizar. You. Thanks. Uh, as the only Muslim state that uh, has nuclear open, can Pakistan potentially provide a nuclear cover for the Muslim world? In other words, do you think Pakistan should put an other nuclear power nations notice that they cannot use nuclear weapons against other Muslim states because that would also constitute aggressive, aggressive against Pakistan? For example, Pakistan can give uh, can Pakistan give nuclear cover against Israel, potential use of nuclear weapons against its neighbors? It's a strategic in the area or just restricted for Pakistan, it's a nuclear weapon? Well, at the moment, first of all, let me tell you, I'm not a great fan of nuclear weapons because I, I do believe in um, uh, settling your issues. Uh, I'm not also a great fan of military solutions. Um, for instance, I would never try and solve issues uh, militarily, but for me, it is basically for defense. I mean, if someone is going to take away your freedom, then that's when, uh, you know, you, you fight for it and you use military. So the Pakistan military, uh, the nuclear program has always been a defensive one because India is seven times the size of Pakistan. It has huge resources now. And the people in Pakistan have always been threatened by, by the idea that a, a bigger neighbor would just overwhelm the country. So remember, we've had three conflicts with India. And the, uh, this was from 48, 1965, and then 1971. Uh, and so ever since Pakistan's had the nuclear program, we actually have had no conflict. So it gives the country of... Uh, uh, 220 million people security when you're facing uh, a neighbor which is 1.3 billion people and hence it's you know I, it's a nuclear program for pakistan is essentially defensive so just to clarify uh this point if in the future you were prime minister and a muslim country was threatened with nuclear weapons would you take action or just stand by? Well, um, you know, uh, I can't say right now that Pakistan would be able to stand up for other Muslim countries right now. I, I just think that, you know, the idea of, you know, I again repeat, the idea of a nuclear war, you know, the idea that you will actually be face to face uh, uh, with another country with nuclear weapons is beyond my imagination and I, I say this simply because you know nuclear war is at the end of the world you must remember it's 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 a suicide attack on the world because uh, you, I don't think the world will be able to uh, sustain or survive uh, a nuclear holocaust so uh, you know the answer to the question is simply that there are other ways that the Muslim countries can put pressure on the injustices that are going against the Muslim countries, and that is through the OIC. Unfortunately, right now, the OIC has not really fulfilled its uh, role as, 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 a, as an organization that would stand up for Muslim causes. Unfortunately, you know, there, there are too many self-interests. There is not enough, uh, governments are not enough representative in the, in the OIC. In other words, they don't represent the public opinion. So the public opinion all over the Muslim world is the same. They feel the pain of what is happening, injustices in the Muslim countries. But when you have governments that have no 
connection with the public opinion, then they they don't they are not bothered what the public opinion thinks, and hence you find very few countries which have spoken out for Muslim causes, because only those countries where you have Muslim uh, democracies where 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 you have governments representing the public opinion. Only they speak out against uh, the injustices, say Palestine and Kashmir, and elsewhere. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to our second segment, and this is a good uh, segue to talk about the Muslim world and the Mus- the Ummah. Uh, I have with us uh, Na- Mr. Naim Jina from the center, who is the director of the Afro Middle East Center in South Africa. He's joining us online. Uh, thank uh, you. Guys. Um, Excellency, in, in many of your speeches, you have equated uh, Western intervention in Iran to how the West inter- uh, interferes in the internal affairs of Pakistan as well. Um, and, and of course, you know, we, uh, m- many of us believe that there's a, a personal um, issue here for yourself also. Since the 1979 Iranian revolution, Iran adopted a, a kind of policy of independence, neither East nor West, as they called it. Uh, and coupled that, in fact, with the hostility towards foreign powers, uh, promoting what it regarded as its version of an Islamic state. Um, that country, Iran, has now lived under sanctions for 43 years, almost. Sanctions, destabilization, etc., um, with the objective, of course, of regime change in Iran. From a Pakistani perspective, how do you view Iran? Um, a hostile power, a potential strategic partner, a competitor. Um, And I ask this question particularly in light of your earlier comments about non-alignment, I think, which is a a very valuable uh, articulation. Um, And uh, and how exactly is Western pressure on Iran similar to that on Pakistan? Well, in in Iran, during uh, Mohammad Mossadegh's premiership, and his government was removed, and this is now documented, was removed by the CIA. And it was uh, because uh, an independent-minded prime minister came, uh, took over in Iran and wanted uh, to, to make policies for the interest of the people of Iran. And so we all, you know, the, uh, we, we all know what happened to him. You know, there was this, first of all, there was this... Um, uh, campaign, uh, propaganda campaign against him in the media. Then it was uh, the opposition parties were paid to do uh, demonstrations against the government of uh, Pre- uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh. And then, and then the, uh, his own party members were given money to change party affiliation. And eventually, it was the uh, the the final was the was the army which removed him. So it was a very similar uh, pattern followed uh, in when my government was dismissed. But, you know, let me just talk about Iran. I find that it is most important for a country to live with dignity and self-respect. I mean, that for me is the most important thing. You know, we Muslims, uh, you know, our, our oath with the Almighty is La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. It gives us dignity, self-respect. We, you know, we are not supposed to bow in front of anyone but the Almighty. And the Muslim countries, you know, when they become subservient or when they become client states, when they lose their dignity, you know, and unfortunately in Pakistan, we have suffered from this. I have found the Pakistan's foreign policy, vast majority of the people of Pakistan, have found it uh, very undignified because we have relied on aid and we stretch our hands and we get money or we or we fight other people's war and then you know we participate a lot of our own people die in this and 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 we, we do it for foreign aid or us dollars and i think you know it has consequences for a society number one the con- society never learns to stand on its own feet because only when you stand on your own feet do you realize your strength. But when you're always having crutches of foreign aid, just because you know, you're trying to serve someone else's foreign policy objectives, you lose your dignity. And for me, uh, I, I, the people of Iran might have suffered, 
but you know they haven't lost their dignity they they you know we, we will disagree with you know maybe what their world view is we might disagree with their world view of islam but you know you cannot disagree with them standing for their sovereignty so you know i admire that about them our next question comes from Maryam Khan, who is a PhD candidate at Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University and also a research associate at SIGA. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's really a pleasure to sit in front of you. Um, I am personally a voter of PTN and I'll, I'll be ever. Um, my question is regarding Afghanistan. Uh, it's been after two decade long war of US against Afghanistan. Taliban have turned to power now which wasn't supported by leftists in Pakistan because they, they saw them as a source of terrorism. Now, we Pakistanis are again uh, facing a wave of terrorism and Islamabad is on high alert. So how do you uh, see the Taliban in Afghanistan and how do, do you think that this, the current security uh, threat which Pakistan is facing now uh, is has something to do with um, Afghan Taliban also? Also, you have supported a lot of um, you know, laws like blasphemy law and uh, religious religion-based laws. But on the same time, you have uh, criticized a lot, a lot of religious parties uh, which were in the collation. So, how do you see the role of religion in the politics? Thank you so much. Okay, so first of all, you must differentiate between the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban. The Afghan Taliban are completely different. You know, their aims and objectives are completely different to the TTP, which is, which is the Pakistan Taliban. Who were the Pakistan Taliban? When the Afghan Jihad was conducted uh, from the soil of Pakistan, uh, it was conducted to what was called the tribal areas of Pakistan or FATA. Now, these were areas adjoining uh, the Afghan border. And all the sort of... Uh, incursions into Afghanistan by the Mujahideen were from the tribal area and a lot of the fighters also from Pakistan were, were, were from the tribal areas and there were Pashtuns which were the Pakistani you know you must remember Afghanistan is 50% Pashtun and uh, two-thirds of Pashtun live in Pakistan and and most of them along uh, along the border the eastern border of Afghanistan so therefore there was a lot of Pashtun sympathy for, for, for the Afghan Jihad. So, uh, uh, hence, from the tribal area, the border adjoining Afghanistan, that's where the fighters used to go in and the Mujahideen used to operate. So, when come 9-11, uh, uh, Afghanistan gets invaded by the Americans. Now, Pakistan... Uh, government took the stand which I opposed we should have stayed neutral they started supporting the US war on terror and so the same people who had been fighting jihad against the Soviets because they were foreign invaders now were told that because it's the US if you fight against them it's terrorism so they turned against the Pakistan government and so what we had was the, in tribal areas, the people turning against the Pakistan government and they, they were called the TTP, the Pakistan Taliban. And so there were two different things. Afghanistan Taliban were, were, were not connected with them. I mean, they were connected vaguely, but not really. There was not real connection with them. So what happened was that after Kabul fell to the Taliban last August, the, the, the Pakistan Taliban were then asked by the Afghan Taliban to go back into Pakistan. And unfortunately, that was a great time for us to, my government was already negotiating with them so that we would do a resettlement of these people because there were about 40,000 people which were moving into Pakistan, amongst them about five to 10,000 fighters, but their families too. So unfortunately, when my government went, the eye was taken off the ball and the new government and the new uh, and the setup, the uh, military establishment did not pay enough attention to what was happening with the resettlement of these, the Taliban coming in. And so therefore we have this uh, wave of terrorism coming in now. Uh, and this is all along the what was the former FATA, uh, the former tribal areas, because they've got merged into Pakistan. So we have a wave of terrorism in Pakistan right now, and this needs to be dealt with before it goes out of hand. 
Now I come to you, what you're talking about, religious parties and uh, religious laws. Look, let me first tell you about the blasphemy law. The blasphemy law was not made by Pakistan. It was made by the British when they were ruling India. And the idea of the blasphemy law was that if one religious community, and remember there were multi-religious communities living in villages. There were Hindus, there were Sikhs, there were Muslims, there were Christians. So if one religious community said something which was derogatory against another religious community of, of, of a sacred entity, so there would be riots, there would be a lot of people killed. So the British then brought in this blasphemy law that you were not allowed to uh, say anything derogatory about any religious entity of any other religion. That's how it came about to stop riots. So therefore, rather than there being lynching crowds and lynching mobs going on and killing people say, who thought that their religion blasphemy had been committed against them, now it was an offense. So you had to actually go to court to prove that. So that was to stop uh, mob violence, lynching crowds. So Pakistan basically inherited the, uh, the, the, the policy. And in Pakistan, it has been, it makes sense because we have uh, different religions here. And we have had in the past, the, uh, when, when someone thinks that our religion has been blasphemed, there've been more violence. You know, there've been uh, people lynched. And this now is an offense in Pakistan because you have to prove that it's blasphemy. And for that, you have to go to a court. Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is about Turkey. And we have with us Dr. Yasin Aktai. Dr. Aktai is a professor at Bayezid Yildirim University. And also he is a former member of parliament and uh, widely known here in Turkey. Dr. Aktai. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for sharing your very, very valuable perspective with us and thank to SIGA for gathering us together in this platform. Uh, uh, for the past two decades, uh, Turkey has become an important and rising power, not only in its region, but uh, also in the Muslim world. I, 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 I think you can share this idea. This belief. The relationship between Pakistan and Turkey is uh, the lasting legacy of pan-Islamism. The story is well known, as you know. Muslims is in the subcontinent supported the Turkish people with their body and wealth during the height of, the height of colonialism. But in reality today, the Turkish-Pakistan relationship is a failure from many angles. Uh, the historical nostalgia has been manipulated by NATO interests as it was dominated and controlled by the military through the Cold War years. Today, uh, it has resulted in nothing tangible. Uh, no visa-free travel, uh, no free trade agreement, no military alliance, no free technology transfer agreement, no people-to-people -people cooperation, etc. Now my question uh, is coming. Uh, do you feel Pakistan has benefited from Turkey's rise? Uh, and if so, how? And do you envision a strategic partnership beyond rhetoric between the two important Muslim states? And lastly, uh, what other Muslim states do you see as strategic partners to Pakistan? Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that there's a people-to-people -people relationship between the people of Turkey and Pakistan. And this again, what you quite rightly pointed out in history was at a time when um, when the, the uh, in Turkey, the, the colonial, the, the Western powers or European powers were about to take over uh, in the 20s or early uh, late nine, uh, uh, 1919 19s and 1920. At the time we were fighting a lot of uh, the Muslims of of, of India and what is now Pakistan sent, collected a lot of money and, you know, they gave, uh, they were, they were standing with the people of Turkey. And I think uh, that's what is remembered uh, in the Turkish uh, mindset. So the relationship is very deep. When I became the prime minister, we, uh, with President Erdogan, 
I had a very good relationship and we were trying our best to further our, uh, our contacts. I was only in power for three and a half years. And in that time, unfortunately, uh, Corona came in. The two years were basically, one and a half years were lost in the coronavirus. And so for our first year, we were sort of, we had a bankrupt country. So we were trying to be solvent. So basically in the last couple of years, we were trying to form what you call trade relationship. We had a, a committee of, of formed by the, the president uh, dealing with a committee formed by me in, in Pakistan to do a further our contacts, our relationship. It was quite a relationship which covered a wide area of things. And unfortunately that, you know, my when my government was removed, we were just uh, deepening our relationship and uh, there were various political crises which kept coming on the way. And we, you know, we, but I do feel that for the future, the relationship with Pakistan and Turkey will grow. Look, Pakistan has gone through a bad period in the last 30 years. We have, you know, we lost our momentum of growth. Pakistan just did not live up to its economic potential. We had two terrible governments of uh, two political two uh, political families who ruled us for 30 years. And they're, and we have, well, they're still here. They're, they've been in power for eight months. And they have basically run this country into the ground. So Pakistan in the 60s was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And especially in the developing world, Pakistan was given as an example. A lot of countries followed Pakistan's model in the 60s, Malaysia, South Korea. You know, we were considered uh, a model. And as I said, unfortunately, in the last uh, three decades, we lost that momentum because, uh, you know, we had very poor governance. So looking ahead, I think Pakistan and Turkish, uh, Turkish relationship has tremendous potential. And we were discussing, there were a lot of mutual areas which we could benefit each other because there's a lot of strengths in Pakistan, which are still, we have potential, but we haven't realized them. But in Turkey, you know, we were working out on how mutually we could benefit each other through trade. I can't leave this without mentioning that you and President Erdogan, and I believe also uh, the President of Iran, were talking about how to confront Islamophobia. Say in one minute, what project do you think the three countries should embark upon to confront this rising problem of Islamophobia? You see, Islamophobia, let me just give you a quick, I'm just going to be very quick about this. This all started when the Iranian revolution took place. There was a fear in the Western countries that all Muslim countries will be taken over by Islamic revolutions. And so they divided the Muslim world between moderates and fundamentalists. And in 1989, when Salman Rushdie, or sometime then when Salman Rushdie wrote that book, Satanic Verses, <coughs> there was a wave of anger in the Muslim countries. The West could not understand why were the Muslims so upset? Because they, especially Europeans, their idea of religion or the way they treat, for instance, Jesus Christ is completely different to the way Muslims uh, love and respect and revere our holy prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and they couldn't understand this and the Muslim world never explained to them why were they so upset and so that added to uh, uh, this suspicion about Islam and then of course 9-11 took place so after that Islam was equated with terrorism for somehow suicide attacks were only by Muslims because we were supposed to be these uh, radical people and unfortunately the worst uh, role was played by the heads of muslim states everyone rather than trying to explain to the western countries that look radicals moderates and liberals are in every human community there is no such thing as radical islam or islamic terrorism you know these were terms given uh, to create the impression that somehow terrorism and radicalism was connected with Islam. And the Muslim heads of state were so keen to become all moderates and liberals just to please the Western countries. They never explained to them that there is only one Islam and that is of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And unfortunately, we never ever helped 
fight Islamophobia. We never, by never explaining anything to them. So uh, Muslims in Western countries suffered a lot after 9-11 because, as I said, Islam was equated to terrorism. Or, and there was this radical Islam, you know, Muslims kept saying we're all against radical Islam. But how was the man in the West ever supposed to understand the difference between moderate and liberal Islam? So they would they thought of all of Muslims as a, a sub terrorist. So now what needs to be done is that OIC must take uh, the premier role in this to explain to Western countries. They must form a body of scholars which will be able to speak to the Western countries in their own language. So to convince, make them understand, you know, the, 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 the differences, what causes problems between uh, and what causes Islamophobia. And I feel that can be done. Uh, and I also feel that, you know, uh, Al Jazeera, TRT, channels that can sort of uh, give the Islamic version to the Western countries are very important. They need to have uh, material which will explain to the Western countries uh, about Islam. Majority of the people in the West do not understand Islam. And the problem is that it can be manipulated by those people who are anti-Islam. So they can manipulate this ignorance against us. And that's why it is very important communication through media and OIC should take uh, responsibility for this. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to remind all the participants that uh, we need to move faster because the time of the um, chairman is, uh, is um, quite precious. Uh, the next person we have is Nasr Zaman Naim. He is the head of the Bangladeshi Student Association in Turkey and also a PhD student at uh, Istanbul Swat Zaim University. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, as we are talking about, uh, as we are talking of the Ummah today, uh, let's turn to an issue closer to home. Um, as we all know that both Bangladesh and Pakistan uh, contains a significant proportion of Muslim, uh, Muslim population in the world uh, today. Uh, but it is uh, unfortunate and it is apparent that the relationships between Bangladesh and Pakistan's are, Pakistan are not good. Uh, so why uh, is this the case in your opinion? Um, also, we are talking, we often uh, speak about the brotherly uh, relationships between um, Muslim majority countries, but uh, all of those talks are actually empty. Uh, so, uh, as a politician, uh, what is your vision uh, regarding Bangladesh? And also, as a politician, um, uh, what would you what would you suggest as a way forwards to improve the relationship uh, between Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan in near future? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, the reason why our relationship uh, has has not grown or improved is because of. Of sadly the events of 1970-71 when the ruling party in pa the party that should have uh, been given government the majority party was not given uh, you know what was not allowed to have its mandate and, and form government in Pakistan and that that led to the break of Pakistan and the formation of Bangladesh but unfortunately the the events that followed the military operation uh, which followed that created that deep uh, and what, what 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 should i say not animosity but it created that uh, distance between the two countries because of uh, the suffering which which took place because of the military action so my government well we i reached out to uh, the, the the bangladesh prime minister and we i also invited her to pakistan but the relationship is not what it ought to be. It should be a much better relationship. There have been periods in which the relationship seems to have thawed, but for some reason the relationship has not grown. But I do agree with you that uh, you know, uh, you know, it, as two of the probably the countries with the biggest population, Muslim populations, we should have far far better relationship than it is right now. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is uh, about Palestine, and it will be asked by Mr. Jalal Khshayb, who is a senior research associate at the Center for Islamic Global Affairs. Jalal. 
Thank you, Doctor. Salam alaikum. Um, my, my question is regarding the, the Palestinian cause and the normalization with the Israel. And as you know, all of you, the, the cause is uh, witnessing now the, the worst days. Uh, if, if we look back to the history, uh, we see each state in the Muslim world which normalized its uh, relationships with Israel found for itself like an excuse under the big name, the umbrella, the real politic. Some of them uh, make the excuse of uh, the, to avoid uh, foreign uh, pressures. Some of them to get back their own land, uh, like Egypt and Camp David. Some of them to size another land, like what happened uh, last two years in Abraham Accords. Some of them to get to win and to gain stability or prosperity inside. Some of them to get protection from uh, foreign uh, threats, like some of the uh, Gulf states and Iran. But in all the cases, those states uh, were the winners and still the winners. And the loser, unfortunately, is the Palestinian cause. Now, as we know, uh, Pakistan uh, is still suffering from the Kashmir problem, more international pressures and uh, instability inside. My question to you, Mr. Uh, Imran Khan, can you assure Muslim uh, million of Muslims and people across the world that Pakistan and the leadership of uh, Mr. Imran Khan will never sacrifice Palestinian rights and Jerusalem and will never normalize the relationships with the Zionist states under any excuse. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, the founder of Pakistan, who we call Qaeda Azam, the great leader, uh, you know, he in 1948 gave a statement on, on, on uh, Palestine and he spoke about the injustice which was being done to the people of Palestine. And he was very clear that Pakistan would not accept uh, or would not recognize Israel as long as the people of Palestine were not given justice. So that has been basically the line of uh, all Pakistani heads of state since then. Uh, and secondly, we have the, the issue of Palestine is almost exactly the same as the people of Kashmir. So the moment we give up, uh, you know, our principal stand on, on, on uh, the recognition of Israel means that we give up uh, on Kashmir too, because, uh, because the, the, the issues are more or less the same. Then United Nations Security Council resolutions, which, uh, which I more or less the same on Kashmir as, as well as Palestine. And, uh, you know, if we, if we say that, uh, we, we, the moment we take, uh, we recognize Israel, then we, we have abandoned the people of uh, Palestine for them to get a just settlement for a homeland. And then it's, uh, we cannot take a stand for the people of Kashmir either. So therefore, I don't think any Pakistani head of state will ever recognize Israel, no matter how tempting it is, because Israel is powerful in the sense it has huge influence in the United States. So United States being a superpower, every you know, country wants to have a good relationship with them. So the temptation is that if you are friendly, if you recognize Israel, you will have good relationship with the U.S. But the problem in Pakistan is that it's a democratic country and anyone who wants to go to the people, he knows that the public will never accept any head of state who's recognized Israel. Thank you very much. We have three short questions, if you may. Thank you very much for staying with us. The next one uh, is going to be uh, Salman Sayed, who is professor at the University of Leeds. He is with us online. Very quickly, uh, Dr. Sayed. One of your greatest achievements has been the mo popular mobilization of unprecedented scale in Pakistan. And I just want to ask you that how will you harness this popular will 
not just to demand new and fair elections, but also to replace the corrupt, current corrupt system inherited from, by the, from the colonizers. You see, the problem most of uh, the developing world, or what, what you call the ex-colonies, all of us, the problems we faced are the same. We have struggled to establish rule of law, justice. I mean, justice means rule of law. Rule of law means that everyone is equal before the law. And when you have colonialism, basically the colonials are above law. And in Pakistan, unfortunately, and like most of the developing, like most of the ex-colonial countries, when they got their independence, uh, the, the rulers mostly took the role of the, the colonizers and they put themselves above law. And so when you have, when you do not have rule of law, corruption becomes one of the biggest symptoms of lack of rule of law because the powerful elite comes, goes above law. And when they start making money, the, the, the state institutions cannot check the corruption. And that's how countries become poor, not because of lack of resources, but the corruption of the ruling elite that bankrupts countries. And that's the case with almost the entire developing world. It's certainly the case with Pakistan. We suffer because for, after colonialism, either we had military dictatorship, half the time we were ruled by military dictators and military dictators uh, clearly when they, when they take over a country, when they decide to impose martial law, they break the constitution. It's against the constitution and the rule of law. But unfortunately, when we've had civilian governments, so-called democratic governments, they also have put themselves above law and which is why they have been able to make so much money through corruption and, and take the money abroad. And it's the same story in almost all the developing world. What you have in the developing countries are the ruling elites siphoning off money and taking it abroad. And that's how, you know, that's the, if you ask me one reason why Pakistan which was rising rapidly and could not achieve its potential, should have been one of the big economies in the world. One reason is that we just did not have justice in our country. We had the ruling elite put itself above law. And when you, when you have ruling elite above law, when, when the powerful uh, cannot be held accountable by your uh, institutions of justice, then the country becomes a third world country. It becomes a, eventually a banana republic. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, give the floor to one of our senior professors, Dr. Uh, Munzer Kahaf, who is a professor of Islamic economics uh, here at Istanbul Subhat Zaim University. Um, professor Kahaf. Okay. Thank you. Uh, of course, I thank Siga and uh, I thank you, Mr. Former Prime Minister, for being with us. But uh, I really, uh, you mentioned about the miracle of China and other examples. And of course, things va vary from one country to another. You can't really apply the same model in, in uh, repeating it uh, as it came from uh, China, for instance. Uh, uh, now, what is your model? What is your program for economic development in, uh, in Pakistan? And especially, I want you to also be a bit specific on a uh, few points. How would you fight corruption? That is not really among the elite, but it had reached even the smallest employee in government or in any corporation even. And also, how would you uh, envision the new uh, economy in Pakistan development-wise and Islamization-wise, especially with the uh, Supreme Court uh, decision of elimination of interest? So okay, uh, okay. Let, let me just say that uh, in Pakistan, if uh, what I was trying to do when I was uh, in power, but only for three and a half years, and what I will again try and do, number one is imposing rule of law. Is establishing rule of law is the beginning of prosperity. I believe that countries that are prosperous, if there is rule of law in a country, it cannot have poverty. If you look at the map, if you just look at the rule of law index all over the world, 
the countries which have a rule of law index above 80 or 90 percent are all prosperous, have no poverty. And we, most of our countries, I mean, if you look at Nigeria, Nigeria is, has the greatest amount of oil reserves in Africa, and yet it has huge poverty. But the, on rule of law index, Nigeria is 7 percent. So it is directly related. If you have rule of law, you have prosperity because it unleashes the potential of a society. You have you have investment coming into your country. Investment always comes into countries which clean governance and and, and capital flies from countries which do not have a, a, a governance, which have, don't have rule of law, which have poverty. So number one, if and that, that is going to be the hardest thing to establish. Number one is rule of law and rule of law will tackle the ruling elite. But the uh, professor, your other two points, you know, we the 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 uh, the verse in the Quran about Amar bil Maruf wa Nahi an al Munkar, which says, enjoin the good and uh, forbid the forbid what is bad. In other words, the moral society or uh, the the moral values of a society matter a lot, because when you make corruption unacceptable, when you stand up uh, for the good. You know what? Strangely enough, the some of the Western countries of Switzerland, Europe, Scandinavia, they actually work on Amr bil Maruf. The society rejects what is bad. You know, the society fights. So corruption at the lower levels can be fought by. And what we started in Pakistan was the teachings of the Holy Prophet, Sirat and Nabi, because that's what teaches you ethics. And unfortunately, we haven't taught our children ethics uh, through the Sirat and Nabi because the Prophet's life, the way he established the state of Medina, the way he raised the morality of the society, the way he established the rule of law by saying even, even if my daughter steals, she will be punished. That countries before you have been destroyed where the powerful when they stole uh, were not punished and only the poor weak crooks were punished. And this is, you know, the problem, not, I repeat, not in Pakistan, all over the developing world. And, and next is uh, education. You see, in Muslim societies, education has to be considered sacred as it was at the time of the Prophet. You know, we, we have not paid enough attention to education to, towards research and technology. And this is what we were, I was trying to do in Pakistan. We were going to set up excellences of center in technology because the future is technology but eventually a country has to be sovereign my i believe that a country must stand its own feet have dignity and self-respect and that's what gives it strength because you know you rely on your own resources a human being that walks on crutches his legs will waste away if we the bigger weight we put our uh, we, we, we lift, it strengthens us. Same with human societies. If you start depending on aid, which we have, and if you depend on foreign loans and IMF, you would never really learn how to stand on your own feet. So a sovereign country is the key for me to, for success. Thank you so much for this. This is the last question, Mr. Prime Minister, and it's from one of our sisters and concerning the empowerment of women. Dr. Yasmin Saeb is also a research fellow here at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. Dr. Yasmin. Your Excellency, thank you uh, so much for uh, giving us your time today. I think it's important for us to uh, end this discussion uh, by addressing uh, the question of women uh, and women's empowerment as we have seen recently uh, incidents in Iran uh, as well as in Afghanistan. Um, many people have argued that no matter what, uh, Muslim countries can never um, give women uh, freedom and, 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 and dignity. Uh, that's uh, some of the prevailing arguments that uh, we hear. And so uh, I'd like to know uh, how do you view uh, this issue and how would you, um, you know, accomplish uh, this um, matter uh, in a society that is quite traditional um, and conservative uh, in many regards 
uh, also in, in, a, in, a, in a balanced way without falling into um, what I would say you know, Western liberal uh, ideologies or, or traps even. Thank you. Okay, so look, um, first of all, I do believe that, uh, you know, the, the revolution, when what our Prophet Muhammad did 1400, 1500 years ago was a revolution because he revolutionized the society. There were new concepts that came in. But one of them was he gave rights to women. We don't, you know, we forget that long before uh, the idea of women's rights in, in Western countries, uh, 1500 years ago, rights were given to women. And, and in the last sermon of the Holy Prophet, he was very clear. He said, men have rights over women as women have rights over men. So the concept and, and dignity, you know, of, of, of women. So in Muslim societies, if you if you look at Muslim societies, you know, yes, so sometimes when the idea, you know, when we, the whole idea of parda is such, which, which I feel that we haven't done enough ijtihad uh, on, enough debate on it. But the whole idea of parda for me was protecting the family system because Islam was very clear that the basis of, uh, of, of human society is the family system. So in protecting the family system, the concept of parda came. But unfortunately, we never developed these concepts so that we can protect our family system as well as uh, not stop the potential of our women to grow. And Muslim societies are still developing these uh, concepts. Unfortunately, we have uh, two extremes right now. On one side, we have uh, women who are uh, in, 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 in the name of Parda, banned from public life. On the other hand, we have the Western liberal ideas about women, uh, women's liberation. So I believe that Islam is what we call uh, the middle way. Islam is not a, a religion of extremes. It is, it, it says in the Quran, it's a religion of the middle way. But we haven't developed that middle way because there has not been enough research and not enough, uh, 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 of debate in Muslim societies of finding that middle way. I do not believe that, you know, the idea when they say it, it, the, the Western idea of uh, the liberation of women, it's almost a competition of, between a man and a woman in the West now. You know, I don't think Islam is much more the idea of a complementary relationship between a man and a woman. And I finally, I think that that in Pakistan, in our conservative societies, I think gradually we are finding our way. But one thing that should not happen is uh, there's a clear verse in the Quran that there is no coercion in religion. You can't force people into religion. So if, when you do that, it, it doesn't. Human beings have to be the heart and the mind has to be won over. You can't force uh, human beings through, uh, you know, through force to uh, to uh, to follow religious edicts and it creates problems uh, uh, you know it will always create problems so i'm i'm one of those who believes that it's through through dialogue through debate through uh, uh making people understand the true teachings of our holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i think that's the way you win over people but not by force thank you so much Be before we conclude um, I just want to let you know that we received many, many questions. We tried to field some of them today. There are many other questions that we couldn't get in, hopefully in the future. But there is one question that I thought it, it needs to be asked. And it come, it's coming from a, the family of Dr. Afia Siddiqui, which says, if you come back to power as prime minister, can you commit to doing everything in your power to repatriate the daughter of the nation, Dr. Afia Siddiqui, within the first few months of your rule? Well, uh, I can only uh, tell uh, the family of uh, uh, Asya Siddiqui that what she went through, uh, first of all, it is tragic what she is, what she's been through to Afia Siddiqui. But uh, I, we, we thought we came quite close to uh, getting her released. We had negotiations going on with the U.S. government. Uh, and there was a, a, a thing of... Uh, a give and take. We were trying to work out on a formula how to get her out of uh, the U.S. prison. Uh, 
but unfortunately it just didn't work out and this was during the trump administration uh, and unfortunately when uh, well i'm saying that when trump lost the elections the the negotiations fell apart but we were quite i thought we were quite close at one point where we could have uh, done uh, a, a deal with the us so we we, we could have got her back uh, so you know the answer is yes i'll try my best again because uh, you know the us government is might listen to if we do a give and take a, a deal with them but uh, you know just straight asking for a freedom is, is not easy because they they say look it's rule of law in the us we have our just a system she's been sentenced to 84 years in jail and so they don't talk about uh, you know there's no way pakistan can pressure them to release her inshallah we'll find a way uh, i just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your time i would like to give you the final few moments for a closing statement well first of all again i want to uh, thank siga for uh, affording me this opportunity you know the problem uh, about muslim world is that you know we are still evolving we are we are coming out of uh, colonialism we haven't found our feet our education system lags behind uh, we don't have uh, a great many scholars who can uh, direct us we have a, a split we have the westernized elites in the muslim world who moved quite far away from the religion and don't understand much about it and then we have a lot of conservatives who do not understand the western thought so you know the best uh, minds right now i find who are sort of doing a lot of good work are scholars who are who are living in the western countries i find that they are they are coming up with some of the best ideas they they understand the western thought and then they can compare uh, you know our, our our life our our, our way of thinking our history our culture the islamic uh, principles and some of them i must say some of the best work is being done in the western countries our all muslim scholars who've gone to the west have done research and they've come up with some great original work what i tried to do in my last uh, well in my uh, time in last two years in my uh, when i was in government i formed a rahmatul alamin authority it was an authority which Uh, Rahmatullahi alamin you know the mercy for mankind the title given to a holy prophet peace be upon him and the idea was that in our schools we would teach children the, the, the life of the prophet because the quran tells us to learn from the life of the prophet and why does the quran tell us to learn from the life of the prophet because he was the most successful man in human history no human has achieved what he has done so our children read uh, books on bill gates or or you know all the sort of uh, giants who've done well in business but they need to understand the man who was the most successful person in human history they need to learn from his life and that's why the almighty tells us to learn from his life to his sunnah and i tried to uh, teach our children about uh, you know the the the, the course in the curriculum we put in the life of the prophet and then in the universities we wanted our scholars to do debate on uh, on the life of the prophet but above all i wanted our, our university students to debate that what did a prophet muhammad do that that brought in this revolution that changed human beings the the there were muslims were hemmed in between two superpowers and yet between 625 and 636 AD what were what 313 army in in the battle of badr and 636 they the roman empire collapses in front of them at yarmouk and 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 then the persian empire so what happened in these in this short period which created these incredible human beings there were in that short space of time there were never so many leaders and yet in the muslim world we've not done enough research on them what did the do because it was not a it was not something physical it was a, a a revolution of the minds the prophet changed the mindset of the people he made them realize their potential in life the same human beings got converted and became these great men but 
What and this is a fact of history that between 625 to 636 in 11 years uh, from nothing from a few uh, hundred people uh, you know who migrated or uh, maybe a thousand people who migrated to um, Medina from Makkah and yet from there they became the you know the greatest uh, civilization of, of, of mankind but uh, not enough work has been done to to tell us the all the things how did the prophet change the minds how did it was a it was a mind the mindset that changed the human beings sort of from from as uh, the great Rumi says why do you crawl on the floor like ants when the almighty has given you wings so the the people of Medina the Muslims had wings they became these great men and unfortunately our young uh, generation does not know that phenomena and that's what I feel that our media and our uh, scholarship and universities should concentrate on. They should find out how these human beings changed. And it's, as I said, it's a fact of history what happened. Uh, and had it been, say, in the, had a prophet been in, in the Europe, uh, European countries or Western countries, there would have been so many films on him, documentaries on his life of how he changed, uh, how this phenomena or from nothing, these uh, these Arabs rose and became, and the Muslims became the greatest power for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the greatest scientists and so on. And I think uh, we need to, you know, when you say what happens next and for the Muslims, I think this is the most important thing that needs to be done. Our scholars need to work on on what happened uh, in these years in Medina. How did how did our holy prophet change these human beings? That needs to be worked on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I want to give some final thanks to Ree Bridges, who without uh, Mr. Majid Rafiq's help and without Dr. Arsan Khalid's help, this event wouldn't have been put together. They were really bridge builders between Turkey and Pakistan. I also want to tell you that we benefited a lot from your uh, talk. and. I think that you gave us a lot of insight into the future, but also I think we today gave you a chance to enter into Muslim history as someone who is the first um, Muslim head of state to be in a part of the Diwaniya, which is an Islamic tradition, to sit with scholars, with, men, with people who are thought leaders and think about problems together. It's a very unique opportunity for us all. And um, we, are, we believe in democracy, but we also believe in epistocracy, that the people who have knowledge are the ones who also help rule. Uh, the Rahmatullah Alameen uh, project that you proposed was very unique, and hopefully in the future, SIGA can collaborate um, with this authority uh, to build a, f a, f of a stronger and more dynamic Muslim world together. And we hope to see you in person in Istanbul, and we hope that you have a very speedy recovery because I know that you gave us a generous time even though you're injured. I know it wasn't difficult. I, was, I know it was difficult, but uh, thank you so much for your stamina uh, and we pray for your recovery.